Excellent. Okay. All right. So um, thank you all for being here. We've got a great group of 27 participants for this session. Uh, I'm Sharon Geyer, and I'm a chemistry teacher in um, Woodstock, Connecticut. Today we have Chris Marks. He has worked as a chemist and material scientist at a Fortune 500 company and a major research university. He has taught chemistry at public and private high schools and at a community college. His long-term interest is bringing quality science to students using materials and methods familiar to them, um, which has led to the current presentation um, that he'll be sharing with us today. Um, so Chris, uh, go ahead and um, take, away, take it away. Thank you. Uh, I think we might have lost Chris's phone number. Um, so uh, maybe I can talk about my experience while we're waiting for Chris to come back. I actually, at Bridgewater State University here in Massachusetts, I attended a uh, one day workshop offered by Ed Brush, who was at the 20, uh, 2006. Oh, Chris is back. I'm back. I don't know, I must have hung up. <laughs> By mistake, when I put the phone down. And my mic was working fine at 8.30, so I don't know what's going on. But anyway, sorry about the delay, everyone. So are we ready? Should I go? Go for it. And you are a co-host, so if you want to share your screen, you can do that. Yes. I wish to do that. Oh. Okay, we can see your screen, so that's good. <clears throat> okay, so um, I heard some of why people are here, and that's that's great. That's why I decided to do this. Um, uh, start with a quick outline of my talk. Um, a little background and then some early results that we had, and, and this dates back uh, eight or nine years. And then since then, I, I updated some of what I did and the equipment that I used and got some more experience doing some stuff actually in the classroom, but similar techniques. And then just in the last two weeks, um, I'm in the, I've just moved from Greenfield to Bath, Maine, Greenfield, Massachusetts to Bath, Maine. So. Uh, that was kind of last minute, and then I have some, some kind of COVID and at-home considerations, a link to a Google folder that has a lot of my old data, um, and then time for questions. So, um, yeah. So, uh, kind of my recollection of the first time I learned spectroscopy, I'm sure I must have had some exposure in high school but my first exposure that I remember was in college and there was a ginormous Beckman UV vis spectrometer and it was probably six feet long and big and you could lift the hood on it or the boot uh, and see the source and the optics and then there was a sample chamber and then there was a separate place to lift up and see the detector and I, I just remembered when I, when I started teaching this how beneficial that was to kind of see. And when I transitioned to teaching um, and wanted to teach spectroscopy because like one of our earlier commentators, it's something I really love. Um, 
you know, I was first very excited by these inexpensive USB instruments, and they're great uh, for, for lots of things. I think they're great for doing spectroscopy. But then when I thought about it and, and got my hands on one, um, it's this little black box that plugs into the computer, and uh, you put the sample in and you push a button, and by magic you get a number that represents the absorbance usually. I guess you, you usually can set that up to do percent transmittance or absorbance. But anyway, you, you can't really see the detector or the source. And again, the sample goes in and it's maybe not obvious its relationship to the source and the detector. So all that has to be done schematically. And I, and I think that that's not good for teaching. Um, it's, it's great for doing. I mean, uh, as, as we'll see, I have some data from, a, from an expensive version of something like that. Um, not work that I did, but something for published data. And then, you know, so in addition to that, there are kits uh, to make, you know, gradings out of a CD or a DVD and using various diodes and, and things. And, and they're great, but if you spend all your time making the apparatus, that takes away valuable time from actually doing experiments. So, you know, I, I never got to this point in, in my teaching uh, to this point, but I thought, you know, okay, maybe if there are students that are involved and there's a maker space, that, that making the spectrometer could be part of that, but I didn't really want to, to do all of that um, and taking classroom, chemistry classroom time to build a spectrometer. So I got to thinking, you know, how can all the various advantages, uh, and each of these ways has an advantage, be captured without introducing any fatal disadvantages and so uh, along about Christmas of 2011, I was not teaching at the time, and I was getting ready to go to a chemometrics conference in Russia. And I just thought, well, I could do a poster about this and kind of baby chemometrics, some of it, how would I teach that? And so I asked my then ninth grade nephew if he would be interested, because I didn't think it would be worth doing the work uh, without a student. And so he was game, and so between Christmas of 2011 and about Valentine's Day, the, the conferences I went to in Russia were always about that time, we did most of the work that I'm going to show, and, uh, you know, I had him do as much as he was willing and able to do, giving up Saturday mornings to, to do this work. Um, so this is a, just an initial picture of, of what we worked with to start with, and I'll talk a little bit about, about the parts. These crates and this tray, I think, came from the dollar store and, uh, you know, construction paper and all, and, and I'll talk a little bit more uh, about this, what, what we built. So this was our source, and this was picked just because it was on closeout on Amazon, $7 for a Dora the Explorer digital photo frame that we used as, as the source. Our, our sample containers were uh, very similar. I don't think both came, but in, in hunting down later, just salt and pepper shakers that had this square cross section and, and reasonably clear uh, uh, windows to use. And then uh, I put out a blast email to all, I was living in Richmond, Virginia at the time, to all of my friends and acquaintances who I had emails from in the area. And I said, does anybody have a camera that they're not using? I didn't have one at that point that I wanted to dedicate to this project, but I thought, you know, I have friends that are always buying the latest and greatest. So I put out a, a call, who's got a camera? That they're that's just collecting dust because they've upgraded and uh, one of my duplicate bridge partners donated this camera to the cause John Clokey so he gets an acknowledgement for for that so that's that's the basics that's the the source the sample compartment and the detector and again here's the same picture I showed before the digital photo frame is upside down here these dollar store uh, like milk crates that we cut out some areas, some black construction paper to keep some stray light. And then uh, here's my daughter who, who was in sixth grade at the time, and, and she did some of the data collection 
on some of the stuff that uh, Jim didn't have time to do. And you can see here, I also had this black fabric to throw over top of everything because at least initially I was, I was very concerned about, um, you know, stray light coming in. So, so we have just uh, some black fabric that's just multiple layers thrown over top. Um, these samples here, I'm not going to talk or present any graphical results of this because I didn't go very far, I never bought a pH meter. But what we see here are those smaller cuvette salt shakers with some, uh, this little bottle here is just some extract that I made from red cabbage as a pH indicator. And I think this is just a sequence of more and more ammonia added. So the, the number one is, uh, is just, I think, uh, tap water with the pH indicator in it, and then more and more ammonia added. Uh, like I said, I never bought a pH meter, meter, so I never did any further, but she, she took the data on that um, and at home in her pajamas, uh, mm -hmm. and she was, she was happy to do that. Um, so uh, the, the methods are, again, you know, wanting to do this at home, I really wanted to push the envelope. So even though I could have gotten little graduated cylinders or stuff, this is how we did uh, the volume measurements. We use this turkey basting syringe out of a kitchen drawer. This is uh, uh, an oral uh, medicine, like for infants or something, that's graduated zero to two milliliters. This is a 30 milliliter syringe, if you can't see that. And then sometimes it was simply just counting drops uh, of, that we added to the cuvette. We might put a fixed amount of water and then, and then count the number of drops that we put in of either water or food coloring to, to keep the total volume the same that we were putting in the, in the cuvettes. And they're salt and pepper shakers, but I will, I will use the term cuvette because that's faster than salt and pepper shaker and that's what we were using them for. Um, so the, the basic technique is to put the cubettes in front of the screen, the digital photo frame that just had a white image on it, um, and uh, take a picture with the camera. And this is probably a cropped image, uh, yellow food coloring, so we have the blank and the sample side by side and, and take the picture. And then alternately between the uh, the blank and the sample, we get the intensities. Uh, this is using the program, uh, the new, new image manipulation program, better known as GIMP. And at that time, I was using version 2.6. And let's see, I've covered up with my mouse movement, I've covered up the, the second part. But yeah, so going through the menus, colors, info, histogram, bringing up this dialog box, and selecting the red channel. In this instance, you can check red, green, or blue, it gives you a histogram uh, of the red values of the pixels in the selected region. And then uh, in, in this version, it would give you the, the mean and median values and they're close enough together. There's nothing weird going on here. So the, the mean uh, intensity for the red chain there is, you know, or the median is probably a better value to use, but it really doesn't matter at this level 185. So we collect those as the intensity of the sample and select a similar region on the blank and get I blank uh, for our, you know, that's kind of the raw data. Um, just as an aside, and one reason that I like to use GIMP and use this histogram function, um, this is clearly a very poorly chosen region. Uh, you know, there's a lot of, of data and a lot of pixels in here that are, that are lousy. And this was done on purpose just, just to show this. But sometimes on an image, um, especially in later iterations, you might have in right in the middle of the, of the sample, there might be some scattered light off the front of the, the cuvette or some glare or something. And, but you still want to select that region. The benefit of using this histogram is that um, you, you see all the pixels and you can move these little selectors. Um, and so, you, you know, these black pixels and gray pixels and things that are clearly not data that we want, I can just exclude them 
and play around a little bit and experience will tell you which are the pixels of interest and that's this big peak in the histogram and I can just eliminate that all the all the pixels I don't want and I get a median value here of 245 um, which is just between these values and these low values um, are the black pixels and all that I don't want so it's it's useful and it, that's why it's my preferred method for for looking at the pictures and taking the the data um, so the uh, I0 which I guess I called the blank intensity on an earlier slide and the I sample and you know hopefully this is familiar to all just how you convert these intensities to uh, absorbance and um, you know over many times of doing this I've used many spreadsheets to organize the data and collect uh, and then um, for some of the math that we did we use octave and I'll be able to talk about that a little in the results okay so initial results so just using blue food coloring uh, and making a beer Lambert law plot our, our constant this was probably done by counting drops and we don't have a you know the the food coloring is already dilute the dyes are diluted so even if we used some of the better um, not just counting drops we really don't know what our concentration is it's just arbitrary units um, and not surprisingly the blue food coloring has the strongest absorbance on the red um, and so you you see the most uh, absorbance there and all of these in this particular instance we were dilute enough to get nice linear plots uh, for Beer's Law um, the next uh, level of complexity that we did was to make mixtures so uh, this represents all these green dots represent mixtures uh, of blue and yellow food coloring uh, that we made the the dots represent um, things that were used in the calibration and um, so over here what we have is the the blue food coloring is in the blue dots and the yellow food coloring that we added is in these orange dots uh, the 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 dots are things that we were used to make the calibration model um, but to make this plot you just leave out each point individually and use the other dots to make the model and then predict the one that you left out but then we additionally made a validation set which is represented by the stars we did several measurements um, of those where they were not used to build the model at all and probably I never did the statistics and rigorously but I suspect that most of the error in this plot is really errors in volume measurement more so than the actual uh, spectroscopy that's just a that's just a uh, an assumption based on my experience with this type of data of course when you when you do these types of linear fits or stuff you're you're assuming no errors in the concentration but I spec suspect as much of this concentration is due to uh, imprecision in making the volume measurements as it is in the um, light intensity measurements but I haven't checked that but anyway it's it's pretty good at the very low end in the blue channel it's pretty noisy but it's certainly reasonable it gets the point off that that we can predict and we could this is something that um, where we used octave we set up just a system of equations to um, to do to do them the solve the system of equations to figure out what the mixture was from uh, the just the spectroscopy of the mixture I, I, if that's not clear uh, ask a question <laughs> I don't think I said that very well um, but anyway we're just making one measurement on the on the um, mixture and then we're able to back out individually what the um, blue and yellow amount that we put in reasonably well um, 
And one other thing that we tried uh, was to look at a bunch of different cooking oils. And for this, I, I doubt it matters in a, in, since this is just visible, but in this, our blank, we did use mineral oil. And we were hoping to be able to differentiate a bunch of different corn uh, cooking oils. Um, and what we found really is that we could tell all the ones with the large blue absorbents, which may be a mistake. I checked that yesterday because I don't believe it now. I think we may have mixed up the colors here. It doesn't make sense to me that the extra virgin olive oil, which, which looks kind of blue, has strong blue absorbents. Uh, so we may have mixed this up, but uh, anyway, we weren't able to really tell the difference between soybean and corn oil and any, or canola oil, as you can see here. But all of the extra virgin olive oils were, were different. So if we wanted to use this as a, as a way of classifying extra virgin olive oil and other olive oil, this would have been, you know, we could have just set a threshold of one absorbance unit in the blue if, in fact, that is correct, but I never thought of it until this week that that, that may be wrong. It may be that it's supposed to be the, the red absorbance. Um, and, and finally, um, the, the other thing that we did is a kinetics experiment where we put blue food coloring in the sample and then at time zero, and we used the metadata from the pictures to keep track of the time. So we didn't need a, a stopwatch and we just took a picture, if not shown here, at time zero, um, I took a picture as Jim added the bleach and it, you know, you can see here, it took us about, you know, 20 or 30 seconds. The, the blue data is our data, uh, for him to put the bleach in and with a gloved hand, hold his finger over the opening and give the cuvette a little shake and then put it back into our little spectrometer and take the, the first actual data point. But the picture was taken right as he was squirting the bleach in and we used the metadata from that picture to know when time zero was. Um, and then, you know, this is a experiment we decided to write up as a, com a communication to JCAM Ed. Uh, this is my nephew, James, Jim Quayano, who has just finished his master's degree in, or gotten his MBA, I guess, and passed his CPA uh, this summer and is getting married in February. So it's so weird to think back on this when he was a, a ninth grader when we, when we did this, uh, this work. But anyway, so a little bit more about this. Um, the green data is published uh, by a British consortium. They made spectrometers available um, to high school groups or maybe uh, their equivalent of community college, I'm not sure. Um, there were 10 or 12 universities around England and Scotland, I think, that, that had spectrometers that were in a box or a suitcase. That's what SIAS stands for, spectroscopy in a suitcase. And, and high school teachers could request to have uh, the spectrometer for a week or so and, you know, get approval and drive to their nearby university and pick it up and do this. Uh, this bleaching kinetics was one of the uh, experiments that was uh, all set up and the, the materials were in the, in the suitcase to do, I guess, or the procedures. So the green data is their published data. Um, and, and, you know, so here we have log absorbance showing that it's first order in, it is linear showing that it's, the bleaching is first order in the, in the color concentration. Um, you know, we started with pretty similar concentrations uh, in, in our arbitrary, and we obviously used a little bit more bleach or our dye was a little bit more susceptible. I don't know. That's why the slope is a little, a little higher. But anyway, the things that I want to point out here is for this particular data, the green data was taken with a $10,000 spectrometer. Um, and it's beautiful and nice and linear. Um, but from a pedagogic standpoint, you know, my fear here is if we go back to what I said about these, these USB spectrometers and stuff, if you put plug that in and you do the experiment and you plot the line and it looks like all of the uh, points are exactly on the line, you know, that's great. If I was doing this uh, 
you know, somebody's life depended on it, I was analyzing a drug or something, I certainly want the nicer clean data. But from a, from a teaching standpoint, there are opportunities here. This, um, and again, I, uh, well, I'm, this is less clear, but, um, you, you know, the noise in the data gives a chance to talk about, about that. So that's something else that can be taught using this data more readily than, than you can with, with the green data. Um, but anyway, it's, it's clear that it works, and you can just see here, here are some of the images, and it's nice that even down here, these last few points are not, diff you, you can't tell the difference uh, between any of the images down here with the naked eye. They all look just like this, but uh, when you get into GIMP and actually measure the intensities, uh, you're still getting good data. We probably took more pictures. Um, but it probably did flatten out because at some point um, it just, you know, essentially you have two cubets of water. Um, okay, so that's a lot about that slide, but I think that's all I have to say. Okay, so kind of the interim conclusions at that point, um, you know, all of the experimental work was done in, in just a couple of months, and and then I went off to Russia and Everybody loved the poster there uh, that we did. Uh, I think it's, you know, the advantage there was that everybody at the conference could understand this and see how it would lead into uh, the more advanced things that were presented at that conference. Um, but anyway, we did, uh, you know, and a year later we, we uh, or maybe at the end of the next summer, we wrote up the communication for JCAM Ed, and it came out the, the next year. Um, so kind of the conclusions from that point is that we could create a workable spectrometer, and we demonstrated that there were lots of different types of experiments we could do. Um, the big thing that I liked is you could talk about the source, the sample, and the detector. It wasn't all just hidden in a sealed up little box. Um, aspects of wavelength or variable selection are, are less since you only really have three channels, it's less obvious, uh, that aspect of it, but it, it's still there. Um, talked about the noise, while it's, it's undesirable in an absolute sense, it's, it's certainly helpful for, for teaching uh, those statistics and that not everything's right on the line. And I think that there's some advantage to doing the manual calculation of absorbance from the actual intensities rather than just having an instrument that spits out an absorbance number. Uh, but again, none of this, I haven't done it two ways and, and compared to see whether the students understood things better. That's just a hunch that I have. Okay. So uh, more recently, uh, did this in the classroom with a, with a variety of different students, and there we, uh, in one school, I was in a one-to-one -one iPad school, so students working in, in groups of two or three doing the bleaching kinetics, for example. One student would be manning the detector and taking the pictures. One person might be using their iPad and making sure that it was, was held appropriately as the detector and then somebody else doing the mixing. And so, you know, doing this, we, we did close the blinds in the classroom and maybe uh, sometimes experimented with turning off the lights the overhead lights, but was just much less concerned with that. And we still got, you know, maybe there was a little bit more, more noise, but because stray reflections from the detector in the images from overhead lights using, using GIMP, like I said, you can, you can eliminate those glares. And I'll show an example of that uh, later. And, and what I found, um, it's, it's, it takes a lot of time to set this up and explain the spectrometer uh, maybe a little harder uh, than, than using some of the other alternatives. So uh, a model that I tried to, to do is to get, especially where I had AP or IB students, the first year students just familiarize them with the use of the, the materials, whether they were using their smartphones or, or iPads or whatever to as the source and the de detector, just get the basic functionality and the Beer-Lambert law with first year students, and then with my AP or IB second year students do the kinetics experiment. 
I never did any of the other uh, stuff in the classroom uh, of yet. So, um, and then more recently, just, just this past week, thinking about COVID and doing things at home, um, you know, maybe students don't want to be using things like bleach and food coloring around their computers or their devices. So I went one further thing. I just uh, bought some of these uh, dividers that are translucent and cut one up. You know, just took one. If we look at this green one, I could cut it uh, along there to give an area that had one thickness. And then with this diagonal overlay, two thicknesses. And then not shown here, there are pockets front and back. And just cut away. Um, one pocket and then through both pockets, the diagonal and this main piece. So working left from right here, I have four thicknesses, three thicknesses, two thicknesses, and one thickness. And this is just a pen to keep the cut edge uh, flat. And this picture was taken. I just went into the darkest room, happened to be my bedroom, closed the blinds, threw the, my uh, Samsung tablet, horizontally put this down and then took a picture with my phone. Um, so here, um, you know, there's some absorptivity, the, the path length and the concentration. So here we would maybe assume that the concentration of whatever colorant is used in those films is constant or uniform. and since it's the same film everywhere, the absorptivity is different. And what we're playing with here is the path length. So how many thicknesses through? So it's a little different, but still might be useful. And again, it's very user friendly to do at home um, because you don't have to worry about uh, sp spills of, of liquids. And so here's just an example. Uh, now on my computer, the, the version of GIMP that's there is 2.10. And something that I haven't figured out now, the units, the default units and settings are no longer showing. And I don't remember whether this was an option before, but here you can see the selected region. And I selected red, green, and blue all together. And sometimes they would overlap and this wouldn't be useful. But here it's easy enough. Again, I've moved the sliders around to help me, this lower one. So the the blue channel is centered on about an intensity of 111 and the green at about 182. And then I'd have to move it again to figure out with the red, but saves a little time of not having to change the drop down here. You can measure all at the same time. And again, you know, this part to get the, this, the blank is down here and then uh, four different sample thicknesses uh, all on the same image. So this was, this was very easy. Um, and again, I don't know, I haven't sorted out. I'm not an expert on GIMP. I use it, you know, every couple of years <laughs> to try to figure it out. Um, and so I don't, I don't know why these are not the zero to 255 the way, the way it was before, but not, not hard to figure out. Um, so this is uh, data, you know, one thickness, two thickness, three thickness, four thickness. And the blue is absorbing too strongly and, and nonlinear. And the red, there's not much absorbance at all in the orange. So the green is w worked out pretty well. And so here's the, uh, here's the green data replotted with a, with a linear fit. Um, so certainly we could pr predict the thickness um, from the absorbance uh, using this calibration of, of the green channel. Okay, so uh, when I first got the, trans the, the dividers, I just propped up the green one in front of the monitor that I'm looking at right now and took a picture. And as you can see, there's a window behind me. And in this image, there's terrible glare and everything. Um, and this probably would have come out better, I think, when I, when I did the four thicknesses down here. I failed to properly account for there's the bottom half of the window down here. So I think there's some glare here. I think I should have selected over here. I think I was just doing one, two, and then this is the three thicknesses thing is, is from over here on this edge. 
But I think, and I didn't redo it, I just wanted to show that even if you take a lousy picture and do a really, I mean, I wouldn't, I would, I would chastise a student for doing this, but even under terrible conditions, and again, the, the blank, there was some, the way the camera interacted with the screen there wasn't good, so this isn't good. But e even so, and I think if I'd have just resampled the four thickness area down here, I think I probably captured a little bit of the, the window glare, not being careful. I, that would have been better, and the, and the blue and the green would have been more linear. But it's even this, which is just awful, is, is not completely useless. Um, so, um, thinking about a COVID and, and doing this at home, um, there are many different types of experiments that could be devised to be done safely at home if students have access to some appropriate, appropriate combination of screen and camera. Um, you know, depending on your, your risk level, using, using some sort of transparent film uh, can get the point across eliminating any use of bleach and food coloring or anything else that you might do. Um, the cuvettes, those salt and pepper shakers, you can buy a, buy the dozen or buy the gross pretty cheaply. Um, so if you're providing lab kits to students, you know, you can go to a restaurant supply and, uh, or go beg a diner that's got a truckload of them because to replace broken ones or whatever that has the right ones, you might provide them. And same thing if you found a, a transparency film. I was a little worried with with what I had when I first saw it, that it would be, that it was too dark. But if you find something that works well, again, just cutting up some of that and providing that to the students could, could work. Um, there are many options for getting the RGB intensities from the images, depending on the hardware and the operating system. I've mentioned GIMP. There's the eyedropper function on MS Paint. Um, Colorzilla is a, is a web app that I might brave in a minute and, and demonstrate that. I don't want to do it now. Um, the one thing I will say is, in addition to some safety issues and all with, with the bleach, I think that would be difficult to do alone, not impossible, certainly not impossible to do alone with the setup that Jim and I used, where we actually kind of built a spectrometer. But um, doing it at home using uh, some sort of screen or tablet and then using the phone and injecting and keeping all the times done uh, might be tricky to do to do alone but some of you mentioned wanting to be able to, to for students to use their own devices in the classroom and, and I did that uh, several times with with IB and AP students and uh, they they love it you know there's one school had absolutely you know no phones out during the academic day, uh, which I got an exception for, and, and they loved that. And they, they mostly, very few instances with those students of, of you know, doing non-experimental things with their phones while they had them out. So that was a big hit. Um, so one thing that I've done, I, this presentation is in the NEAC conference folder, and we may copy some of this, but what I've done um, is created a spectroscopy at home folder that is linked to from the presentation, so you can get to it that way if we don't copy this. So this presentation is, is this file, uh, the, the sheets thing that I did, the calculations for for the graphs that are in here that weren't old is here and then the bad image and the good image from the thin films that I have there is all there and then this demystifying spectroscopy folder that was the title that the editors at JCAM Ed gave um, that uh, communication so the article is here uh, if no if people don't have access to the JCAMED otherwise, you can find a PDF of the article there. And then there's this supporting information folder, which has uh, the electronic lab notebook that Jim and I used, um, a sheet of instructions for teacher, which is uh, somewhat dated, but the GIMP instructions still work. I did not double check the, the instructions for using paint to 
to get the um, information from. And then the poster that Jim and I presented at the Russian conferences here, which has all those more details about the procedures and stuff that we used from the early work that I did is, is all in that f folder, um, as well as in all of these folders have the, sometimes there's a spreadsheet in there or something, but all of the images, the raw images. So um, anyone that wants to, you don't have to ask further. I'm happy to hear from people. But if you just choose to give your students a set of images, if they can't, like for the bleaching kinetics or something, because you don't want them playing with bleach at home alone or anything else that you want, the raw images are in those folders and, and happy to have anybody to use them. So with that, I will thank you. And maybe before I take questions, I will risk showing you um, the ColorZilla. Uh, um, so it's just a... Can I, yes. can I interrupt you for a second? We only have a few minutes left, so... Um, oh, really? I'm sorry. I didn't realize it was so late. So why don't so, we yeah. go ahead and open up... Let's hold off on the ColorZilla because I'd love to have yeah, people yeah. To take questions. If you have a question, um, would you mind raising your hand and I'll call on you if there's a lot of questions? Um, there's a raise your hand feature. Um, I don't know how many of you... Or maybe we just should jump in. I don't know. Doesn't seem like there's a bunch of people raising their hands. So go ahead and jump in with a question. Well, people are muted. Oh, I will unmute everybody. <laughs> Let's see here if I can do that. Uh, I think we can unmute ourselves if we have the question. Oh, yeah. Go ahead and, yeah. I think everybody can unmute yourself and ask a question. Um, hi, I had, my quick question was, um, is there a preferred, um, uh, gosh, a calibration lab, uh, one to just like, oh, the kids build it and everything else and then just test to make sure that it's working in a good way? Well, I mean, before, a, after this month, I would say, you know, use those, those, if you have a transparency film and if you can get a linear plot on one of the, one of the channels, um, okay. would, would certainly do it. I mean, food coloring works, but there, you know, that takes a lot longer to do like, it, cause it takes a separate, uh, a separate image for each, um, thing. And, and one thing that I, somehow I, didn't mention just on the kinetics experiment. Um, I don't know if this is still the case, but our, when we went to put all the images um, into a Google folder, Google somehow stripped off the seconds from the, from the image metadata, the time. So if somebody found a way to put a, a watermark on the front of the image that had the time out to the seconds. So that was very useful. So that's just something to watch out for that I didn't, I think it's in the text, but I forgot to mention it. But anyway, yeah, food coloring would work just fine, that, that first simple uh, Beer Lambert Law plot. But again, I think easier maybe is if you've got something translucent that you can just do multiple layers of. And, and there, it's easier to know that you've got exactly twice the concentration or three times the concentration. Uh, because I think doing it at home, the, the errors in the volume measurement are the biggest source of noise, and that's eliminated with the thin film measurement as well. A question about cuvettes. What do you, what do you think of using just a, uh, like a, a drinking glass, or did you try some other sort yeah, of- Yeah, I mean, I've thought about that. I I've never tried it, but if you used a drinking glass, um, I think glare and because of the changing angle, yeah. and I think you'd have to be very careful. I think it's doable. I think it is doable, but I think you'd have to be very careful to get the data right from the center because mm -hmm. the change in path length would 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 be would be uh, you know a big source of noise. But I think so. I you know I think I could pull it off. Uh, being very careful, I don't know that I would suggest that to a student. But again, you know, it would be kind of interesting. Maybe you could do the math 
Um, if you had an advanced math student where, again, using one image and just calculating with the change in path, you know, measure the diameter mm -hmm. of the glass, and then using, you know, very carefully, you know, taking vertical slices, you could do, you could, uh, again, do path length versus absorbance um, if you calculated the change in path length. So there are things you can do there, but for, a, for an initial quick and easy you'd have to have somebody that's pretty careful and pretty savvy to calculate the path length, uh, the changing path length. Yeah. Assuming a round glass. If you have a square glass, perfect. Mm -hmm. um, we have a question from Chris. Sure, thank you. Um, I, I was wondering if you were to do this remotely, if you think it would be effective if, if you, I was interacting with the students over Zoom, if I put up a, a, just the image uh, with what the, you know, a supposed concentration gave them, you know, four or five images to let them screen capture and do the work on their own uh, and then give them a sure. unknown and then ask them if they could determine what the concentration is, that that would be an effective kind of pseudo experiment to do online. A absolutely. And that's why I made all the raw images available to people. If you want to use my images, you're, you're welcome to. The concentrations you'd have to get from the lab notebook, but all, all that information is there. One thing, especially on the kinetics experiment, but again, and that, again, I think that's unlikely to be done at home. You end up with a lot of images, and we took a lot more images, and some of them, because you're taking images fast, especially when the concentration of bleach is high and it's changing, you know, sometimes the autofocus doesn't work, but you just take more pictures that you need. But then it was useful for the group to divide up the pictures and not everybody analyze every image because there, there's a lot. Um, so giving a group of students a set of pictures and having them divide works well. Um, there was one other thing I was going to say about that. Oh, I asked Jim uh, uh, a month ago, and I told him I was going to ask him what he thought, uh, because, you know, again, we can all speculate, and you all are all probably better than I am at knowing how the students would handle this. But I just asked him what he thought, whether he thought he could do it at home, given instructions. And he thought the experimental part would be he could do that very easily for the simple experiments. Um, with without me, the one thing he did say, and of course, remember, he was in ninth grade when when I did this, and you know, doing a little linear algebra, you know, because I taught him that, and and some of the math for the kinetics, uh, he was remembering and like thinking that that wasn't so good, uh, or that he would have difficulty doing that. So just that that was, you know, his memory from from eight years ago, uh, eight and a half years ago, was that 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 would be the part he was a little intimidated about about that but again he was in ninth grade and and you know in two months to be try to teach him kinetics and the logarithm and all that and then the linear algebra for doing the mixtures and all i mean it, it, i did bombard him with an awful lot um but he he was very confident that as his ninth grade self if i had just given him the instructions and left the room he could have taken the data and done the experiments um and so i think with a little bit more you know if you're doing a, a an online lecture to and just focusing on one right if you were just focusing on the kinetics or just focusing on the linear algebra and you had older students that had maybe done that in another it would work pretty well um that was that was his comment about it um, I think we're going to have to wrap up. Um, Chris, thank you so much for sharing this with us. Um, I know for me personally, this has just opened up so many possibilities. And uh, the fact that you've posted those initial images there are so helpful. Um, so we can really start even without any of the equipment. Um, so your email is available and you said at the beginning that you're willing to field questions by email. Is that correct? Sure, sure. I'm not teaching right now, so I would give me great pleasure to any of you who are need a little help. And when you get to doing things face to face in the classroom, if I'm not too far away, I'll, I'll come and help. Um, but certainly, as you as you try to tackle these things online, I am happy to hear from anybody that, that needs help. If if our you know again, I let Jim hang himself a little bit, you know. So if the if if the that, that electronic notebook is often 
you know, what he wrote as a, as a student and what he thought was complete. So if my memory is good, any, anything you have questions on or want to use, uh, you're free to, and I am happy to help and get questions from anybody going forward. Well, thank you so much. I, I guess I'll speak for the group and say that it has been really helpful and it's given us, given me tons of ideas for how to implement this at home with my students. I plan to get this started on the first week with my AP kit. So thank you so much. Hi, um, Sharon, can I just butt in? Well, yeah, thank you. please, Chris. Uh, yeah, Chris, thank you so much. Uh, I, I'm sorry for cutting you off there. I just wanted to suggest if anybody wants to follow up on this, like I'm thinking of all sorts of ideas for how to scaffold this for at home. Maybe we could get together like in a breakout room during the coffee house at five today. Okay, that sounds good. I, so I, I can, can do that. <clears throat> All right, so everyone has awesome. the link to the coffee house in the daily program. Is, and so you can click on that Zoom meeting and continue the conversation about implementing these ideas in your classroom. All right, Chris, do you want to take over from awesome. here? No, I think uh, I'm uh, I'm good. Uh, it's uh, three Chris's. It's like my kindergarten class. We had five. <laughs> um, so okay, uh, so here's what we're right. gonna do. So is I, we're gonna I, wrap it up. The morning. Uh, so technical issues. Some technical issues, but we got um, we've got a lunch block right now. The coffee house is not gonna be monitored at lunch, but you can feel free to go in. It'll be open. Um, but we have uh, afternoon sessions coming up at 1:15. There's four concurrent sessions and then the coffee house link too. Um, make sure you uh, are going to that bit.ly slash NEAC 2020 links document that always shows uh, what's going on and that you can uh, link through. And uh, please just email NEAC1898 at gmail.com. Uh, Google cut us off from sending emails, but we can still read them. So uh, we're good. Yeah, they think we're spamming for some reason. Anyway, uh, it was great seeing everyone. Thank you, Chris. And thank you, Sharon. You did an awesome job at uh, facilitating. Great. And it's been really nice working with all of you. And I'll see you guys at the next session. <laughs> all right. Thanks. Bye.